over to Virginia Holman, who is the president of the Island Wildlife Chapter, to introduce our guest speaker today. Unmute myself. Hi, I'm Virginia Holman. As Madison said, I'm the chapter leader of Island Wildlife. We're located in the Cape Fear region. And today we're happy to host Paula Gillikin. Uh, Paula is the North Carolina Coastal Reserve and National Estuarine Reserve Research Reserve Central Sites Manager. That's quite a mouthful. Uh, she's an environmental specialist who manages two sites of the 10 sites that comprise the North Carolina Coastal Reserve. She manages the Bermuda Island Reserve in Onslow County and the Rachel Carson Reserve in Carteret County. She also works on advancing solutions for the coastwide problem of abandoned and derelict vessels and marine debris. She received the North Carolina Coastal Federation's Pelican Award in 2020 for helping manage and organize the removal of nearly 127,000 pounds of marine debris from waterways around Beaufort. And in 2018, Paula was awarded the prestigious Governor's Award for Excellence in Public Service. Before she joined the North Carolina Reserve 14 years ago, Paula worked as a biological consultant for numerous universities and nonprofits. She managed the Ecology and Conservation Laboratory at the Duke University Marine Lab. And Paula holds degrees in environmental science and biology from the University of North Carolina at Wilmington and a master's degree in animals and public policy from Tufts Veterinary School near Boston. And welcome, Paula. Thank you for that very nice introduction, Virginia. I really appreciate that. Can everyone hear me? Fantastic. So, I'm um, so happy to be here with you today to take you on an adventure to two sites of the North Carolina Coastal Reserve, and those are the Rachel Carson Reserve and the Bermuda Island Reserve. Um, great, it's not uploaded like it was before, so you have to bear with me because I'm not seeing my notes now, but um, we should be good to go. All right, so today, um, I'm going to take you on an adventure, so it's not going to be your typical presentation, but I want you all to hop on a boat with me. So imagine we're on, we're starting on a 27 foot Carolina skiff in the shallow waters of the Rachel Carson Reserve, and we're going to do some background information on the reserve program first, but it's a beautiful day, so I think we should start off in this skiff right here, leaving from the NOAA lab in Beaufort. So this is our passenger, our only passenger vessel um, that we have in the reserve program that's kind of dedicated for that use. So I want y'all to go ahead and um, hop on board with me. All right, so about our program, it's it's a complicated program. So I'm gonna glaze over it and not spend that much time on it because we want to spend time on the, the two sites I was talking about. But our program structure is a state federal partnership. So it's a partnership between the Division of Coastal Management at the state level and the um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration at the federal level. So what that means is we get an annual renewable grant at the federal level to manage the North Carolina National Estuarine Research Reserve, and that um, gives us money to manage our four federal sites, but we have six more state ones um, so we have 10 sites overall, but I'm only talking about two of them today. So you can already see it's a little bit complicated, but what it means is we have um, 10 beautiful sites that are protected for the primary purposes of research and education. And you'll see that that mission of research and education is um, encompassed in this mission statement and in these overlapping bubbles that show that our focus is research, education, the stewardship of the lands that we manage. And also you'll see that purple bubble in the lower left hand side where we have visitors 
like you all who come and do compatible traditional uses such as walking on the beach and birding and swimming and boating and fishing and enjoying the sites like we all have for many decades and even um, hundreds of years uh, with fishing and other traditional practices. So as I mentioned before, we're part of a federal program, which is national. So there are 29 reserves around the country, including the North Carolina Reserve. And a lot of these other reserves in other states only have one property. But in North Carolina, we are unique in that we have four federally designated sites. So again, some of these other properties around the country look a little bit different than the ones in North Carolina, but we're all preserved for the same purposes, primary purposes of research, education, and stewardship. And we take the information that come off of our lands and filter that information back into the coastal management system to make sure that we're making informed decisions about our lands and, and how to protect the lands and how to make sure that they're resilient into the future. So these are the 10 sites of the North Carolina National Estuarine Research Reserve. And so our umbrella program is called the North Carolina Coastal Reserve, and that's kind of where it gets complicated. But again, two of those sites today I'm talking about, the Rachel Carson Reserve, which has that national designation with the four sites, and then the Bermuda Island Reserve, which falls under that umbrella designation. So how this happened is that with the four um, national sites were designated first, and the state thought this was a really good idea. So they threw six more sites under this umbrella program that only gets state funding. So that's how we ended up with the 10 sites. So that national designation came first. State said, hey, this is a really great program. We're throwing six more sites in there. That's how we got all this property that starts almost at the Virginia border, ends right at the South Carolina border, encompasses over 44,000 acres. Our main office is in Beaufort, so kind of centrally located, but we do have other offices in the Wilmington area and also for our, our northern sites. So this is a map of the Rachel Carson Reserve in Beaufort, and that is in Carteret County. I'm sure many of you have been there. I see some of you on this call um, that I recognize. And the red line is the boundary of the Rachel Carson Reserve. It is about 3,000 acres, a little over 3,000 acres. And you'll see that it is just south of the town of Beaufort. The town of Beaufort is on a peninsula. It is um, nested in between two rivers. So you have the Newport River on your west or um, on the left side and the North River to the east or the right side. Then the Rachel Carson Reserve to the south. And then um, to the south of the Rachel Carson Reserve is the Cape Lookout National Seashore and Beaufort Inlet. So this is a great example of an estuary. You have those two rivers coming down, the mouths of the rivers eat, um, meeting the Beaufort Inlet, a full salinity situation with the Atlantic Ocean. So this, these creatures that and plants that live in this estuary have to be highly adaptable. Um, very unique environment, very beautiful environment. The, the Rachel Carson Reserve is, is absolutely um, fantastically beautiful. I just, um, I'm not biased at all. Uh, it is comprised of five different islands. You'll see um, Town Marsh, Bird Shoal, Kara Island, Horse Island, and Middle Marshes. And those islands have changed a lot over time. Um, mostly town marsh and, and bird shawl. And I'm gonna give you pr some perspective on that. So as we go along in our boat trip, we're gonna be going along Taylor's Creek. So we're starting just south of Beaufort, kind of on that left-hand side of the map, and we're going along in Taylor's Creek on our boat trip. And um, I'm gonna advance here. And this is kind of the habitat we're gonna be going along in the creek over to the um, right side of this aerial photograph along the, um, the town of Beaufort. You can see there in the harbor, we're seeing some sailboats there in the harbor. And we're um, starting kind of at the upper right hand start of, uh, part of that picture and coming towards you in the screen.
And so that previous picture, let me go back to that. So that is looking to the west. And then this picture of the Rachel Carson Reserve is looking to the east. So our bow of the boat is facing to the east and we're over towards the left hand of the picture in Taylor's Creek. Hey, Paula, Virginia, yes. I've lost your screen. Oh, you have? I don't I know if any, so. anyone else is experiencing the same problem. All right, I'm going to reshare and see if it comes up. Is that, can you see it now? I, I am able to see it now. Thank you. Okay, so we, again, we're looking to the west here. So our stern of the boat is pointing in this direction and our bow of the boat is pointed in this direction. And we're in the upper um, left hand creek here pointing to the east. Um, the special thing about this reserve and something I learned recently is that my sixth great grandfather um, owned the part of the island you see in the upper part of this aerial photo. So it, um, it kind of solidifies the bond I have with this land and my first cousin five times removed owned the upper right part of the the island um, in the 1800s and the the sixth great grandfather owned the upper left part in the 1700s um, so it it I, I kind of have a deeper bond to the the site than I even did before so just a, an interesting tidbit there so this is what an aerial perspective now. And so what you're seeing with these white round sandy areas on the north side of the site as we go along, these are elevated areas of sand deposition that the Army Corps of Engineers, um, when they dredged out this creek that we're motoring along in, to um, make it deep enough for navigation, for um, economy, for the, the Menhaden boats that were um, really prospering in Beaufort in the early 1900s um, through, the, through the early 2000s, they put those dredge spoils up on the northern part of the island. And the Rachel Carson Reserve was designated in 1985 However, this easement that the uh, Army Corps has is perpetual, so they can put this uh, material there in perpetuity, and this builds the island up in elevation significantly. So as we go along in the boat, if we look to the south, we are not able to see the Atlantic Ocean the entire length of the island. In some places we are, but if we were going along in the 17 or 1800s or even early 1900s, we could look to the south and see straight out to the ocean. So just think about how vulnerable Beaufort would have been in the 17, 1800s and even early 1900s to some of the hurricanes. So think about, you know, resilience and, and even into the future, how this dredge boil might be a benefit um, to the to the people to the people in Beaufort. So just think about how this looks now. And this is how the reserve looked back in 1942. So you'll see some of those circular areas down on the west end of the site and the right end of the site in this photo. So the Army Corps had already started some of that deposition. But what I want to point out is the really thick red line that is there in this photo, kind of towards the left side. That is a bulkhead, a rock bulkhead that was put there in 1915. So if you were in downtown Beaufort in 1915 or any time before, you could look straight out to the Atlantic Ocean. And in fact, ocean waves were rolling into downtown Beaufort. So this rock bulkhead was put there to stop the sand from coming into downtown Beaufort and also the waves so that there could be um, a safer harbor and a harbor that would be better for navigation. And so this rock bulkhead ended up stopping sand and over time the Army Corps deposited more and more material there and built it up and the town is, is much safer, but it looks drastically different. And I love maps, so I like showing this, this change over time. 
So Town Marsh, here, here's what it looks like now that it's built up. It looks a lot different and that rock bulkhead is almost completely buried underneath. So we're the boat and the red arrow and we're going along in Taylor's Creek and we've kind of dipped into um, some smaller creeks in the area of a place called Deep Creek and it is anything, um, anything but deep. And so what are we going to find here in this Deep Creek area where we're going to find diamondback terrapins and we'll find a lot of them. So this one on the left is an adult female and the one on the right is um, one that the mayor of Beaufort found when he was doing a cleanup on the island and you'll see that it is larger than the size of a quarter. He found it in um, October a, a few years ago so it was a little bit larger than um, a hatchling so it had probably hatched that year. So lots of terrapins um, all around the site. And so now we're moving closer to Carrot Island. And so in 1976, Carrot Island was advertised for sale in the News and Observer paper and local people uh, citizens, marine scientists, conservationists became very upset that Kara Island was for sale. There were um, wild horses there. Uh, people didn't want, uh, you know, a, a bridge to be built. They didn't want it to be developed. And so the Nature Conservancy um, ended up getting involved and it ended up eventually being protected, but it, it was kind of scary the way it got protected. It was because there was a glitch with the way the the auction of the land was going to happen. There was a legal glitch with it. So thank goodness for that legal glitch or the Rachel Carson Reserve may not have received the protection that it did receive. So now we're coming up on the boardwalk to Carrot Island and this is a way if you want to come back and visit a uh, great way uh, you could take your own motorboat there or a kayak or a paddleboard. You could launch at any um, one of the many public access areas that are found on the mainland of Beaufort. You can find a brochure on the town of Beaufort's website that shows all the launch points where you can launch your kayak. One of them being the boat ramp right across the way at the intersection of Lenoxville Road and Front Street. Also at this boardwalk, you will find a fenced in restoration area. And if you're wondering about the fence, the horses consider this plant within the fence like Ben and Jerry's ice cream. So we have to fence it in and I call this an exclosure area so that the horses won't eat the plant. But this plant is the seaside little blue stem, Shizacarium littoral. And this is the host plant to the federally rare crystal skipper butterfly or A. tritonopsis quinteri. It only got its species name several years ago because it is so rare and it's only found in this part of the world. So the Carteret County area down into the Onslow County area and there are areas of the reserve where we are losing a lot of its habitat. So we're reestablishing the habitat in, in um, other areas of the reserve to kind of mitigate that loss. And so what are some of the other things that we'll see as we're taking our boat trip around the reserve? Well, well, we will see as we get out to the middle marshes area, we'll see um, nesting egrets and their young. We will see if we're lucky, um, gray fox and maybe some of the, the non-native red fox. Uh, we'll see whelks and bottlenose dolphins if we're lucky, uh, several different species of fiddler grab, and of course our native North Carolina oysters and that is just a handful of the species that we'll be lucky enough to see. Lots of protected species on the site. Again, we've talked about the diamondback terrapin. We could see um, piping plover, the American oyster catcher in the upper left hand part of this. No, well, I have my go bag of has a tag on it, which um, volunteers or staff can report. Those are monitored. And the middle um, upper that is a painted eastern painted bunting 
And on the upper right is a, um, a red knot, which is federally threatened, and you'll also see a tag on that. So we're, we are, are always collecting data on tagged birds and making sure that data gets to the proper authority so that the uh, can contribute to their conservation. And of course, we have uh, wild horses. And I know you've heard of wild horses being in numerous locations along our coast, and they are also located on the nearby Cape Lookout National Seashore, Shackleford Banks specifically. And this herd is related to the Shackleford Banks herd. You could consider them to be cousins. They have some similar DNA markers. However, they don't intermix unless it's during a hurricane that may wash some horses off of our island that land on the Shackleford Island. Um, that has happened. The last time it happened was in Hurricane Isabel, but those animals were brought back to the Rachel Carson Reserve. We have um, a herd of around 30 that we try to maintain. Um, we uh, currently, they are a little, they're a little fewer than 30. Um, we manage those with birth control. And you'll see in this photo, photo I'm in the lower right with a, a dart rifle. And I am searching out a select female to administer birth control to. This is a non-hormonal immunocontraceptive birth control that um, select females get once per year. And after several years, um, they could be permanently sterile. So we're, we're um, careful about who we birth control. Um, we actually had a foal that was born in the, the past several days. We, one of our biggest challenges with having these wild horses is our uh, visitor horse interactions. And you'll see that this one um, is an inappropriate one. And this is a kayaker that went by one of our older mares who is no longer around, but she reached up and grabbed her tail and ran the mare's tail through her hand. And miraculously, uh, this lady did not get kicked. Um, I was on the mainland side of uh, Beaufort in my work boat, zoomed in with a lens and took this photo while I was um, screaming, yelling, um, trying to save this lady from getting kicked. And um, I went over and talked to her afterward, but I couldn't get over there quick enough. But luckily, um, she didn't get hurt. Um, if this would have been another animal that was feistier than this particular mayor that was very old and not very reactive, it could have been a different situation. Um, horses, even though they act tolerant, um, they do like to have their own space bubbles just like humans do. And we encourage people to keep their distance. As you can see in this photo, stallions do fight and I actually almost got run over by these two stallions when I was coming around a corner. So even though I'm super savvy about horse behaviors, um, you know, things can things can happen. And so we want our visitors to give them a healthy distance because they can witness the most natural behaviors at um, the greatest distance like this. This is actually a mare standing up with the stallion laying down, which is typically it's the opposite. It's usually the stallion that is standing up with the mares laying down. But this is a, a zoom lens that I was using, a 600 millimeter. So if you give them their space, you can witness these really natural behaviors when they're comfortable and relaxed and and see what they do um, when they're left alone and given space. It's really interesting. And this is what happens when you don't leave the horses alone. And this is um, Assateague Island National Seashore. Um, they will bite and they will kick. And fortunately, we don't have much biting in our local herds because we don't have um, car camping. But this is where things could go if the horses get too habituated um, on our islands in, in Carteret County. We don't, we don't want to see this, so we do um, constant education with our visitors. And these are some of the symbols that we use to help people understand that they need to maintain 
distance, um, at least the distance of a large bus, and we partner with the organizations um, locally, the Cape Lookout National Seashore, and also the Foundation for Shackle for Horses on these education efforts. So one of our child, another challenge at the Rachel Carson Reserve, uh, which you won't see very much of as we go along in our boat trip, you won't see much of it now, but there has been a lot of it in the past and it will recur in the future. But marine debris and um, large items of marine debris, uh, a lot of it that comes off of shoreline infrastructure during storms and consumer debris. So about 170,000 uh, pounds, actually a little bit more, has been removed since 2007. And uh, a lot of that was recently removed by paid cleanup this winter um, by a, a storm debris grant. And it is part of a larger project where storm debris is being move, removed from all along our coast, including other coastal reserves. So now we're going to jump down to the Bermuda Island Reserve and we're all going to jump on kayaks and paddle boards because the waters around Bermuda are pretty shallow and it's a better trip if we do it by kayak or paddleboard. So this is the Bermuda Island Reserve and it is a thin strip of land. It's in Onslow County. It is nested between mainland Holly Ridge. So that's in the upper part of your screen and the lower part is North Topsail Beach on the Barrier Island side. It's about 63 acres and it doesn't encompass a lot of water like the Rachel Carson Reserve did. And this is a view by drone. One of our research fellows uh, captured these images. You'll see a lot of PVC poles in the image and in the upper left, you'll see a lot of white dots and I'll kind of zoom in on one of those white dot areas here in a minute. Those are areas that delineate oyster leases. So oyster leases are found all around the shores of the Bermuda Island Reserve. And an interesting fact about Bermuda Island Reserve is that it was once a barrier island thousands of years ago. So instead of the North Topsail Beach or Topsail Beach area being the barrier island, Bermuda was a barrier island. That was a long, long ago. And it was also, it was used for agriculture. And there was a, a bridge to um, Bermuda that is no longer there. So you can see better in this photo, the the oyster leases, so some of them are bottom leases near the individual PVC poles where you can't really see anything, but then you can see some of the floating infrastructure along the Bermuda shoreline and some of the shoreline of the other nearby islands. Those are um, floating leases and we don't um, approve those. We get to comment on those through the Division of Marine Fisheries, but those are the, um, those are the leases that have the, um, the floating systems. Another thing that Bermuda is known for is its rich archaeological resources. And I just want to preface this with, <coughs> excuse me, the fact that um, visitors are not supposed to be harvesting these um, resources. And this is an archaeological um, artifact that I harvested off of the island, but I have permission to do that um, through the state archaeologist and I sent, document things and send it um, straight to them. So this is one of the most intact pieces that has come off of the island in a very long time. And this was um, some type of um, holding vessel or, or some type of uh, vessel that held liquid. And I measured it and documented it and sent it up to, to Raleigh. But this was not just a little shard. It was um, a rather large piece, as you can see. And this was from the middle woodland period, which lasted from about 300 BC to about 800 AD, so long, long ago. And this is the assistant state archeologist. Um, I go in the field with him once every few years and he scans the shoreline and looks for 
archaeological resources that are eroding off of the shoreline that are of um, importance, and he documents those things. Um, sometimes a skeleton may wash off of, of the shoreline every once in a while. And this is a Native American oyster knife that the assistant state archaeologist pointed out to me. I never would have known that's what it was. I would have walked right by it. Um, I think that is fascinating. Um, one, people ask me, um, oh, how do I access Bermuda and can I go there with my family to have a picnic? And I always tell them, um, you know, it's, it's you probably want to enjoy it um, by paddling around it and enjoying it from the water because it is full of snakes. Now, this snake is completely harmless. It's a rough green snake. It's um, it was a really fun snake to find, but it's also full of um, other types of snakes, including poisonous snakes and um, which is uh, also great because they are part of the ecosystem too, but it's, Bermuda is not a place where you go set up and have um, a picnic. It's uh, very thick vegetation and it's a beautiful site, but it's one of those places that you um, might be able to pull up when the water levels are down, like right along the shoreline, but it's not a place that you really want to go, you know, hiking hiking through the, the thick brush because this is what you're going to come across. You're going to come across copperheads and different types of snakes and it's not all that hospitable for, for hiking around. And um, I just realizing that I'm ending on a, um, a copperhead for Bermuda, so <laughs> sorry about that. Um, these are our social media handles. If anyone would like to note those, we don't have one for Bermuda because that's not typically a site that gets a whole lot of attention. And then we also have a nonprofit that supports us, Friends of the Reserve, and that's their social media handle. And then here is my email address if you would like to follow up with any questions um, after we have our Q&A. And with that, we can start our Q&A. Um, Virginia, unless you would like to handle it differently. No, it, that's great. This was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much, Paula. Uh, Don Willis was asking if the NOAA lab is open to the public. So the NOAA lab in Beaufort is not open to the public right now. When it is in its normal operations, um, it is open to the public um, on a limited basis through some reserve program programming and some NOAA programming like through their open house, but not just on a daily basis. Very good. And uh, as far as the marine debris program, why are you all seeing so much marine debris? Are people just discarding their vessels and and walking away? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's not just the Rachel Carson Reserve that we're seeing this on. It's we got, um, I, I should have mentioned this, but the Bermuda Island Reserve per acreage density had the most of all the reserves from uh, where um, marine debris was removed. And this is because of the shoreline infrastructure that suffers damage during storms. So this weight that you're seeing, this tremendous weight mm -hmm. um, is it comes from pilings, it comes from dock sections, it comes from heavy items like that. And the significance of those things is that it damages habitat. So it can suffocate some habitat. 
Um, some vegetation or a lot of it will come back. However, it gives a chance for invasive species to take over that habitat before the native vegetation comes back. And it can also exclude um, wildlife from using those areas while it is suffocating that vegetation. So um, there is a concern about that. Of course, um, those numbers are not including the vessels that have landed there. So it's actually a lot more um, and when the vessels are factored into that, it would be much, the weight, the weight would be much more. And the consumer debris um, is a very small portion of that weight. Mm -hmm. And the consumer debris is mostly um, discarded carelessly. It's not, um, mostly not left on the site by people sit you know bringing it onto the site and just leaving it on the beach some of it is mm -hmm. but most of it is flying out of boats most of it is getting away from people carelessly they're not throwing it on the ground it's just being careless you know not securing debris using um, single-use products that easily get away from people and blow away um, like I said, some people are irresponsible and leave it on the site, but that is a very small proportion of what we're finding on the island because you can kind of tell when they leave it um, on the beach versus you know, when it gets away from people. Okay, good. Uh, John is asking what types of protections are available for our state fisheries through the reserves? So we allow um, commercial fishing within the reserve sites. That is like a protected use mm -hmm. within the reserve sites. Um, when the reserves were first designated, the reserves did not allow any type of hydraulic um, clam kicking gear or certain types of gear that were soon thereafter outlawed um, altogether. So mm -hmm. the reserves initially did provide extra layers of protection for things that eventually came down the pipeline as law through marine fisheries. Um, so they don't offer any extra protections now in that way, but they did at the time that they were designated. I'm trying to think in additional um, ways. Um, our data has contributed to additional protections in fisheries. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, our um, data that has come out of the reserve and out of reserve studies, such as um, terrapin studies in the Masonboro area, has contributed to the diamond, the establishment of the diamond back um, terrapin management area down in the Mason Bear area. So that's not um, direct, but it is an indirect effect of it being a reserve. Now, are you all participating in the terrapin tally? Yes, absolutely. Um, that Terrapin Tally is a partnership between the reserve program, mainly mainly the uh, reserve program Southern Office staff and the Wildlife Resources Commission. And so that's been mainly um, a Mason Barrow Island effort, but it has been expanded to other reserve sites and the Rachel Carson Reserve will be included this year. Is any interesting data come come out of that? Maybe maybe some of our audience would like to know a little bit about why we're counting the terrapins throughout North Carolina. Right. So the terrapin is um, a species of special concern, and not a lot is known about the density and the population sizes. We know a lot about terrapins in certain discrete areas, but we don't know a lot about terrapins along the entire coastline. So we know uh, and can manage them well in tiny little pockets. So we need to understand more about the terrapin um, along the entire coastline rather than just in these tiny areas. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason that um, the Wildlife Resources Commission has been charged with um, getting more information about the terrapin and because 
the Mason Borough Island uh, Reserve is a research reserve and they have partnered with the Wildlife Resources Commission to come up with such a good survey method and involve citizens. Um, they're extrapolating this method to the rest of the state because it's impossible for the Wildlife Resources Commission to survey the entire state, state with the staff capacity they have. So this has been shown to be um, a reasonable survey method um, is replicatable. And so at least these different sites around the state can be compared to each other in the, you know, the density of terrapins mm -hmm. that you find in an area. Um, and so, you know, it can reveal, well, wow, there are there are a ton of terrapins here relative to here. So maybe we should do further studies in this area. So it may not reveal exactly the number of terrapins that live in that area, but it could really um, send up a flag for, hey, we need to do more detailed fishery studies um, in this area or not. Is there any sort of intersection between types of marine debris and uh, diamondback terrapins? Not that, not that I know of. I mean, there could be somebody looking at that, but I'm not aware of that research. Okay. We we had often heard that they were getting trapped in in crab pots. Yes, there is there. Yeah. Yes, so there is that. So um, lost fishing gear certainly. Sorry, I wasn't thinking about that type of marine debris. Right. So lost fishing gear, um, particularly the juvenile terrapins and males that have the lower profile shell. So the mature females that have the higher profile shell. So an old female can't fit in a crab pot, whereas the sub-adults and the males with that lower profile shell can fit right in there. So um, your older fecund females won't be able to get in there. So it is a, it's a huge problem for certain age groups and certain sexes of the males. And yeah, they can they can get in there and um, they, they will eventually um, perish. Yep. So thank goodness for our crab pot cleanups are, are helpful, um, certainly, and the bycatch reduction uh, devices in the um, diamondback terrapin um, management area. Some of the research has shown that they should be very effective. So we'll see um, what the data shows in those areas. And I, I know they're, I think they're already been implemented or are being implemented currently. And how many horses do you currently have on Rachel Carson Reserve? So um, we have had a few that have um, passed away recently. So at this point, we have around 27. Mm -hmm. And the average age? The average age or right like now, um, I haven't looked in our spreadsheet lately, but I will tell you that our oldest mayor is 31. Mm -hmm. That is because she has been birth controlled. If she had not been birth controlled, um, our, our females would only live into their upper teens. Okay. Um, our males, um, their average lifespan, of course they are not birth controlled, our upper, um, our upper, upper part of the upper lifespan would be into the 20s for the males however their average lifespan is um upper teens mm -hmm. and that is because they tend to get in trouble with fighting and adrenaline related activities um that lead to them only living an average lifespan of upper teens and I assume there's not a lot of intervention for that sort of thing because. Yeah, we try to let them be as wild as possible. However, um, they do get into trouble sometimes. If they get into trouble and it is caused by something that a, um, a human has done, we will intervene. Okay. Um, also, the horses are very present on the Beaufort waterfront. And if something happens to a horse and it's right in the public eye and it's upsetting to numbers of people, we will intervene um, because that can be quite traumatic for families who are recreating on, on the beach. 
um, we will intervene and we will, um, you know, try to get the animal out of the area or we will tranquilize the animal and try to fix the situation and wake the animal back up or we will euthanize if it's a morbid condition. Very good. Logan is asking, is there a reason that the mares who uh, have birth control have a much longer lifespan? Yes, it's just a matter of wear and tear on the body. When you don't have a foal every few years, um, you're much healthier. Um, you have a better body condition. You don't get as thin during the winter and you can live a longer life. Very good. Does anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask Paula? You can raise your hand or type something into the chat box. Or Paula, is there something else you'd like to tell people about the reserves or would like people to know? Yeah, I would just encourage people to um, go to nccoastalreserve.net and look at all 10 of our sites. They're not very you know, well known um, like our state and national parks are because their purposes of protection are different, but they are just um, beautiful places to visit and and pretty magical. They're pretty primitive. You know, we don't have a lot of visitor accommodations, but they are, uh, they're pretty special sites for the adventurous. Great. Cool. Oh like yeah. I have a question that has come in. John wants to know, is trawling in estuarine reserve waters and use of unattended gill nets allowed in reserve waters? And what effect does that have on juvenile fish populations? So the, you know, trawling is all based on division of marine fisheries rules. So I don't know in all reserve boundaries, I can't remember, um, you know, which reserve boundaries would allow trawling and, and, and which ones wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all for, um, that's all covered under marine fisheries rules. It's not covered under our rules. And then gill nets are also covered under marine fisheries rules. So we don't, we don't um, cover that directly under our rules. And yeah, I don't, I don't know about, you know, the impacts. Um, uh, certainly, trawling could have, you know, impacts on juvenile fish populations, depending on the pressure. Um, there's a lot of ifs, and you know, that would be hard for me to address that, you know, just be depending on the intensity of the trawling, and that's just a hard question for me to address, but that's not something that we directly manage. Very good. Well, this was fantastic. We're getting lots of thank yous and, and great presentation in the in the chat box. And it was a fantastic presentation. I really appreciate you joining us today and, and speaking with, <clears throat> excuse me, Island Wildlife. Next week, uh, Tuesday at 12 p.m., we have ornithologist Lauren Farr from North Carolina State University. She's going to be speaking about birding basics. So if you've ever wanted to go birding and don't know exactly what to look for, Lauren's going to tell you how to do it <laughs> like, a, like a pro. So we're looking forward to that talk. And that's it. Thanks so much. Thank you everybody for your interest. Bye-bye.